President, ladies and gentlemen, a, a very warm welcome to you all on this rather inclement uh, evening to the Royal Society. Um, my name's David Reed. I'm the Biological Secretary of the Royal Society and a Vice President. And my first task, the least pleasant of, of all of them this evening, is to ask you that if you have brought in a mobile phone, could you please check it to make sure that it's switched off? Thank you very much. <laughs> Tonight's speaker is Professor Steve Jones, who is Professor of Genetics uh, in the Department of Biology in University College London. I think Steve probably needs less uh, by way of an introduction than many of our scientific uh, colleagues, because he's already, already extremely well known and highly respected, uh, first of all as a researcher and as a lecturer, but also as a contributor to the public debate and understanding about science. Steve won the Aventis Prize in 1994, when it was then known as the Rhone Polonc Prize, for his book, The Language of the Genes. He also writes a regular column in the Daily Telegraph and has made, as I'm sure you're aware, many uh, uh, television and radio appearances. His expert use of writing, lecturing and broadcasting to bring science to wider audiences led to his receiving in 1997 the Royal Society's Michael Faraday Prize, the UK's foremost award for communicating science to the public. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to present Professor Steve Jones to you and to ask him to give his lecture, which is entitled, Why Creationism is Wrong and Evolution is Right. Steve. Uh, uh, thank you for those uh, kind words. Um, I'll concentrate much more on the second part of my title, Why Evolution is Right, and uh, much less on the first part, why creationism is wrong. Um, on the front of this uh, lectern is a, is a motto, the motto of the Royal Society, which I'm sure some of you can read, uh, not from the back, if not from the back. It says, nullius in verba, which if my old level Latin serves me right, means trust not in words. And that actually is a wonderful motto for a scientific organization. Don't listen to anybody's opinion, look at the facts. Trust not in words. And that's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about whether I believe in this or that. I want to talk about the facts that make me certain that evolution is right and hence, by extension, that creationism is wrong. Of course, there have been... Uh, humans have always tried to understand where they came from. And there have been many images and models of creation, some of which are really rather beautiful. We're all, of course, familiar with this one, which is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Um, I would like to think that most of us would see that as a metaphor of human origins, uh, but in fact, that globally, that's a minority view. Most people in the world, it's clear, have some literal creationist model um, of how humans, and by extension, the rest of life, actually emerged. We know about Adam and Eve. Um, uh, if we follow the Bible precisely, it turns that this picture was painted. Um, the event took place on October the 4th, I think, 4004 BC. Um, at 11.30 in the morning, that was the time of the creation. Well, it's, good. It's, a, it's a beautiful story, and it's beautifully written in the Old Testament. But, of course, there are other models which other people believe. Almost as many people believe this model. This is the Chinese creation myth, or the Chinese creation model. It's a god whose name is Pan Gu. Um, he emerged from a cosmic egg in the void. He, grew, he appeared on Earth. He grew for 18,000 years until he, his head banged against the sky, which was 30,000 miles high. His head then exploded. His eyes became his, the sun and the moon. His tears became the world's rivers. And the fleas and the lice of his body became ancestors of men and women, respectively. Well, that's, a, that's another model of origins, which many people believe with equal passion as do the literal believers in the story of Adam and Eve. And of course, one of those models might be true, but they can't both be right. 
There is another model which I have a little bit more faith in, um, which comes from this rather well-known book here by Charles Darwin, M-A-F-R-S, F-L-S, as he later called himself, which is The Origin of Species. And that sees evolution not as a matter of belief, but as a matter of fact. Um, Darwin called this book One Long Argument. And that's what it is. I think it's, it's occasionally rather a dry read, but it's well worth reading. Um, and at the end of having read that, I would find it very hard to deny the truth of evolution. Well, that's three models of evolution. The, uh, uh, the Christian one, the Chinese one, and the Darwinian one. And what I want to do in the rest of my talk is put forward the evidence why I, myself, prefer the last of those three. I know I'm in a minority. Um, so more than half the American, popula more American population believes in some form of creationism. If you believe the BBC poll recently, which I'm not sure that I do, it was rather oddly um, phrased, something like 30 or 40 percent of the British population also believes in some literal model of creationism in the not too distant past. Um, as I said to my American publishers, I don't mind if those 150 million creationists burn my books as long as they buy them first. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, they don't show very much sign of doing that. Um, I, George Bush himself has said, on, evolu on the issue of evolution, the verdict is still out on how God created the earth. Well, I always find it rather odd that Americans in particular deny the truth of evolution. <laughs> because the evidence of common ancestry is really quite overwhelming. <laughs> um, now, we all know that, uh, that Gilbert and Sullivan said, Darwinian man, though well behaved, is really but a monkey shaved. Some of us are perhaps a bit closer to that shaved monkey than others are. Um, but um, it's clear that uh, this, this uh, creationist story is really very powerful in the United States, and you all know about the various attempts there have been to introduce it as part of the school curriculum. And I think it's to, very much to the... Um, uh, to the uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great advertisement for the strength of the U.S. Constitution, which separates church from state, that every attempt to do so so far has failed. Of course, that isn't true in Britain, where we have faith schools where people can teach whatever they wish. You can argue about whether that's a good thing or not. And as a result of that, creationism has certainly found a very considerable toehold in the last couple of years, or three or four years, here in Britain. I've talked to tens of thousands of school kids in my day, and not until four or five years ago did I ever meet any creationists. Now I meet them wherever I go. Of course, some of it comes from one particular religious worldview. Here's a a uh, rather extreme Islamic website talking about evolution. Societies in the West are full of lies. The children are taught lies in schools. Human beings evolved from apes. Uh, they're taught evolution as an accepted fact. Islamic upbringing ensures they're not subject to useless and non-existent concepts like in the West. So I think, I think here in Britain we do face a problem. And I hope, I'm, I don't know whether I'll succeed, that I will at least suggest to you um, those of you who might believe in creationism, that there are reasons for doubting um, that particular belief. Um, well, I, until recently, had a rather general um, philosophy that I didn't engage, or many biologists would agree with me, Richard Dawkins, I know feels the same, uh, doesn't engage in conversation with creationists because you can't argue with people who have a profound belief. The essence of science is doubt. We're full of doubt all the time. We say we don't know. We argue with each other. Somebody who is profoundly believing doubts nothing. And that makes life difficult. Um, I've only ever really had one useful